In this video, we'll look at the other side of adding heat to a substance. In the previous video, we looked at how adding heat to a video can increase the temperature through something called the specific heat capacity. And now we're going to look at what happens when you add heat to an object and instead of changing the temperature, it changes the phase. So from solid to liquid or from a liquid to a, a gas. And it does this through something called the latent heat of fusion. And uh, the word latent is a way of saying hidden. And this energy is considered hidden because essentially without the object changing temperature, it makes it appear as though that energy is, um, is missing or that it's not um, obvious where the energy is going. So the definition of the latent heat of fusion is the energy required to melt a unit mass of a substance, that means one kilogram of a substance, at its melting point. That's really important that the, the latent heat of fusion only applies to something once it reaches the point at which it melts, which is at a specific temperature. All substances have a um, point at which they melt at a standard um, pressure. So the symbol that we use for this is LF for the latent heat of fusion, and it would be the amount of energy Q per unit mass. Now more often than not we will use the um, equation in this way that Q is equal to MLF but obviously we could solve for LF or we could solve for um, M. So the units are a little simpler for the latent heat of fusion than it was for the specific heat capacity because it's just the number of joules per kilogram in order for the phase change to occur, melting, um, or we could be extracting energy, in which case we would be doing the reverse of melting, which is freezing. Um, just to give you a few, an, an idea of, of how large some of the latent heats are, let's just take a look at just a small number of substances and their latent heats of fusion, and we'll put the um, melting temperature. So let's start with water. That would be an obvious one that we'll look at quite a bit. And the latent heat of fusion for water is 334,000 joules. And of course, I think everyone knows that the melting temperature of water is at zero degrees um, Celsius. Um, another liquid, a uh, form of alcohol called ethanol, so ethanol is in a lot of the gasoline um, that you might buy. Uh, oftentimes they'll put as much as 10% ethanol, which is a form of biofuel. Um, that guy has a smaller latent heat of fusion, only 1.09 times 10 to the fifth, or 109,000 joules per kilogram, sorry. Joules per kilogram. And its melting temperature is quite a bit lower. It will melt or freeze at negative 114 degrees Celsius, so very, very cold. Um, if you look at metals, for example, aluminum, um, aluminum actually has a, a latent heat of fusion that's actually very similar. The amount of energy to melt one kilogram at its melting temperature, this is really important, at its melting temperature, um, is actually pretty similar to water. It's 3.95 times 10 to the fifth. However, it occurs at a temperature of 660 degrees Celsius, so much, much hotter temperature before it will even begin to, to melt. Um, we can look at another example of a metal that's a little easier to melt. Uh, this guy actually requires quite a bit less energy than water. It's only 2.3 times 10 to the fourth, so only 23,000 joules per kilogram and that occurs at a much lower temperature than for aluminum, that occurs at only 327 degrees uh, Celsius. So besides the latent heat of fusion, which is the energy required to melt the substance, there's also a, a similar latent heat, and that refers to the latent heat of vaporization. So let's take a look at the latent heat of vaporization. Um, again, the, the definition of it would be essentially the same. So the latent heat of uh, vaporization is the energy per unit mass, but more often than not we will use it in this form, 
in order to look at how much energy is required to melt a substance, we would just simply multiply the latent heat of, of vaporization by the mass of the substance that we want to vaporize. Um, we'll make a similar table. We'll use all the same substances. Look at the latent heat of vaporization, which is joules per kilogram. And this would be called the boiling, sorry, boiling temp. And that again will be in degrees Celsius. So you'll see that these uh, latent heats are much larger. So what is essentially is happening when we are going through a phase change is we're increasing the distance between the, the molecules. So when you go from a solid to a liquid, it's just a very small increase. It's a tiny increase in the spacing between the, the molecules. But when you go from a liquid to a gas, we are tremendously changing. We're increasing the distance between the molecules incredibly. And so the latent heat of vaporization is almost always going to be significantly larger than the latent heat of um, fusion. So for example, water, it is 2.26 times 10 to the sixth joules per kilogram. So 2.2 or 2.3 almost million joules in order to vaporize water as opposed to only 334,000 in order to melt the same quantity of ice. And everyone I'm sure knows that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. It's defined to be 100 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> we'll look at ethanol, aluminum, and lead once again. So for ethanol, ethanol um, can be vaporized at a much, it's much easier to vaporize. It vaporizes at a lower temperature and requires much less energy in order to vaporize it. So this guy is only 8.4 times 10 to the fifth, so about 850,000 joules um, per kilogram, and it occurs at a temperature of only 78.3 degrees, so a little bit lower boiling point. Um, aluminum, on the other hand, is much more difficult to vaporize. So this guy requires 1.05 times 10 to the seventh, so 10 million joules per kilogram in order to vaporize it, and it will not occur until you reach a temperature of 2,467 degrees Celsius, so ex extremely hot temperature, very, very hot temperature. Um, lead is a little bit easier to vaporize, it actually will vaporize at 8.49 times 10 to the fifth, so actually very similar to um, ethanol, and it occurs at a pretty high temperature though, so the temperature occurs at 1740 degrees Celsius. So the latent heats of fusion and vaporization are just simply the energy required to separate the molecules from each other and change their phase from either solid to liquid or liquid to gas. So let's take a look, before we look at a complicated problem, let's just take a look at a, a little bit simpler problem. So we're going to look at a level one problem. So let's bring this back. And in this problem, all we're going to do is we're just going to take some ice at a temperature of um, negative 20, and we're going to raise the temperature until it melts, and after it melts, we'll then continue to raise this temperature by continuing to add energy to it until we brought the temperature of the water up to 70 degrees. <coughs> so, I, I, normally I would not do this for, for a problem. I would just simply make the calculations. But just to, to make it clear what exactly it is that's happening in this um, calculation, I'm going to specifically state what I'm doing in each step. And then we'll put the calculation over here to the right. So I need to increase the temp to the melting point. Once I reach the melting point, I'll need to melt the ice. Once the ice is entirely melted, I'll need to increase the temperature to 70 degrees. Okay, so these are my three steps. Take the ice at negative 20, bring it to zero degrees. Once it reaches zero degrees, melt all of the ice. Once all the ice is melted, take the water now up to 70 degrees from um, zero. So the calculation, there'll be three separate 
there'll be three separate calculations. The first one will be bringing the temperature up to the melting point. So that is going to be 0 0.150 um, kilograms of ice. Very important to remember that the specific heats and the latent heats are all in terms of kilograms, the fundamental unit for mass. Um, in this case, the specific heat capacity for ice, if you can remember from the previous video, was 2200 joules per kilogram per degree Kelvin or Celsius, or, or I should say Kelvins, or per degree Celsius. And we need to raise this by 20 degrees. So from negative 20 up to zero, We'll figure out what that is. And then in for the ice, what I need to do is to melt the ice. So this is going to be the latent heat of um, fusion. So that'll be 0 0.150 times the latent heat of fusion, which was 3.34 times 10 to the fifth. That will give me some value. And the last one is, now that the ice is all melted, now I need to take the water and raise that up to 70 degrees. So that'll be 0 0.150 times 41.86 latent heat of, uh, sorry, sorry, specific heat capacity for water. And then now we need to go from 0 to 70 degrees. So that'll be 70. And what we end up with is um, 6,600 for the bringing the ice up to the melting point. Then in order to go from there to the to the liquid state, there will need to be 501, sorry, 50,000, 50,100 joules. And then lastly, we will um, take the water and raise this temperature up to 70 degrees. That'll be 43,953. I can add all of these guys up now. That gives me 10653. So I can give my final answer now. We'll cut that down to the correct number of significant figures. The total energy required to raise the temperature of ice from negative 20 to water at 70 degrees will be 1.0 times 10 to the fifth joules. So a little bit of a tedious calculation in that I, I actually kind of have to do it step by step, but not a complicated calculation. I'm either using the specific heat capacity or the latent heat of fusion, depending on what state that I am. And I'm just following the steps as I move through the phases and move through the temperature changes that I need to for each of those um, specific substances. <coughs> so now we're going to move on to a little more challenging problem. So in this problem, what we're going to do is the, the mixture again. But this time, we're going to mix a liquid with a solid. And of course, the solid uh, substance, so ice, will be at a lower temperature than the water. And the two are going to exchange energy until eventually they meet the same temperature. Now, the only question is, will all the ice melt? So there's a possibility that all of the ice will melt and then that ice in its liquid form will continue to raise its temperature until eventually the water that was in the container and the ice are all liquid at some common temperature. Or the other alternative is that there's not enough um, heat in the 20 degree water to melt all of the ice, in which case they will meet at a temperature of zero degrees. Um, and technically there would be a third possibility and that is that um, there is so much ice in there that not only can the ice not even melt, none of the ice melts, and some of the water in the, um, the liquid water actually starts to freeze, and so we end up with more ice. So in order to make this, this um, deduct, to deduce whether the um, ice is going to melt completely or partially, or possibly even grow, maybe even there'll be more ice than there was when we started from, what we need to do is to look at each step individually. So if the ice were to melt completely, the first thing it would have to do is to raise its temperature from negative 10 degrees up to zero degrees. And so we're going to make several separate calculations and then we'll compare them. And based on that comparison, we'll be able to decide whether the ice is going to melt completely or whether there'll be some ice left over. And if there is ice left over, we'll, we'll figure out how much ice is left over. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the amount of energy required to bring the ice up to zero degrees Celsius. 
So that is going to be 0 0.120 times the specific heat capacity for ice, which again was 2200, times the temperature change, which in this case was only 10. So that would require 2640 joules in order to make that, that change. Now, if the ice did all melt, let's calculate how much energy that would require. So that would require us to use the latent heat of fusion, 3.34 times 10 to the fifth. And that would require 40,080 joules of energy. Okay, so now what would happen at this point is the uh, ice would be in the form of liquid water, but the water would be at zero degrees um, Celsius. So the total amount of energy required to bring the ice up to the temperature, the melting point, and then actually melt it would be 42,720 joules. Okay, now what I'm going to do to figure out whether it all melts or not is to look at the water that was at 20 degrees and figure out if there's that much energy. So if the water going from 20 degrees down to zero degrees turns out to be smaller than this number, then there's not going to be enough energy, right? Because where is all this energy coming from? Where does the 42,720 joules come from? It comes from the water. So if the water gets to zero degrees before all the ice is melted, then the ice is not all going to melt. Everybody will be at zero degrees, they will be at thermal equilibrium, and there will be some unmelted ice still in the container. So the number I'll be comparing to is this guy, 0 0.250, remember a milliliter is a gram, and there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. In this case, it's the specific heat capacity of water, and I'm going to drop the temperature by 20 degrees. So when we make that calculation, it turns out that the uh, liquid water has 20,930 joules in which it can give to the ice before it will be at zero degrees Celsius. And at that point, the ice and the, and the water will be at the same temperature and they'll stop, um, the exchange will be equal and so the ice will stop melting. <coughs> so in answer to the question, no, the ice will not all melt. There's not enough heat in the liquid water to melt all of the ice. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna figure out how much water will there be left over so that we can um, put a number on it, not only answer the question, does it all melt, but then we'll figure out how much of the ice is going to melt. So what I'm going to do first in order to do that is I'm going to subtract this. Now clearly there's enough energy to raise the temperature of the ice up to zero. I mean that only requires less than 3,000 joules and I have plenty of energy to do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract these two. And when I subtract those two, I will end up with 18,000 290 joules left over. So that's how much energy I can give to the ice. It won't melt all of the ice because the ice needs 40,000 joules to melt all of it, but it will melt some of it. Clearly it will melt a significant portion of the ice, probably almost maybe around half of the ice or so, a little bit less than half of the ice. So now I'm going to make a calculation and that calculation will go like this. Using the latent heat of fusion, I'm going to calculate the amount of ice that will melt by simply taking this energy that's available and dividing by the latent heat of fusion and it will give me the mass of ice that is going to uh, melt. So that's 18,290 divided by 334,000 and that will leave 0 0.055 kilograms of ice or we would say 55 grams. So 55 grams of ice will melt, the remaining will stay um, unmelted. So the answer to the question is no, the ice does not all melt. Um, only 55 grams of ice will melt before the entire mixture is in thermal equilibrium
at zero degrees Celsius. So that's like a tricky problem to um, think about. Um, it's not as straightforward as some of the problems we looked at before where we could just look at the total exchanged energy and then we come to a common temperature. Um, what will happen to this substance is the final temperature will be zero degrees and there will still be um, around 65 uh, grams of ice. 65 grams of ice will still be left in there and all the remaining portion will be um, liquid water. So the final temperature is zero and there's still a significant portion of ice um, left. So let's modify this problem just a little bit. Let's assume that we actually do have enough water. Let's assume we have a lot more water. Remember, we have about half of the energy that we need to melt all of this ice. We can get part of the way there, but we can't get all the way there. So let's just increase the amount of mass of water, or let's increase the volume of water, and see how you would handle the problem. If you felt confident that you knew that there was enough water, then you would probably approach this a little bit um, differently. So in this example problem, we're just going to use all the numbers from the previous problem, except that we're going to take the volume of water to be 1,250 milliliters instead of 250 milliliters. So that's about five times the amount of water at the same um, temperature. So in this case, we will um, use the approach that we used in the previous problem, and that is that the total change in energy must be zero. Because if there is any change in the total energy, then in the change in the total energy, then that means energy must have left the system. And we're going to keep this a closed and isolated system. This is a system that's in a calorimeter, and the calorimeter is designed very well. Let's assume it's a perfect calorimeter, so nothing is lost to the surroundings. We're going to ignore the effects of the calorimeter, although it would not be very complicated for us to take the calorimeter into um, account. So in this case, we would see that there are four different um, four different uh, delta Q's. So just to remind you, we need to take the ice up to zero degrees. We need to melt the ice, then the ice will be in water, then the water will continue to increase in temperature until it finally meets some common temperature with the 1250 milliliters, which has been decreasing in temperature. So if I look at the ice, So um, in the case of the ice, that is going to be the mass of the ice times the specific heat capacity of ice times its change in temperature. Okay, now that's a known quantity. I know how much the temperature of the ice is going to change. It's going to change by 10 degrees. Um, I'm, I'm not solving for any, any missing temperature in here. Um, I know that the ice is all going to melt. So that'll be M1 times LF. Okay, what I don't know is that once the ice turns into water, so I'm saying M1, it's no longer ice anymore. M1 was ice, but now it's not ice anymore. Now it's liquid water. So it would be the specific heat capacity of water times its change in temperature. Now that I don't know. So I don't know the final temperature of this mixture. So there is a quantity in here that I don't know. This is the first time that I've run into a, a quantity that I don't actually have the value for. And I know that the liquid water that was in there, we'll call that M2, it also has the specific heat capacity of water and has its own temperature change. And I know that if I added all of those things up, they would all add up to zero. So the ice goes up to here, and the water. So the ice is these three, and the water is this one, and the two are going to eventually meet at some common temperature that is somewhere between zero degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius. So now, plugging in the numbers, so remember the ice was 0 0.120 times the specific heat capacity of ice, which was 2200, times the temperature change, which was 10. So remember, that was at negative 10 degrees. We're going to raise it up to zero degrees. Then we're going to melt it. And the specific, uh, sorry, the latent heat of fusion is 3.34 times 10 to the fifth. Okay, so that's melted all the ice. Now the that ice is in the form of liquid water. <coughs> whose specific heat capacity is 4186. And now I run into that property that I don't know. I don't know the final temperature of this substance, but I do know that it's going to start at zero degrees.
Um, and then the last one is the water, which is going to be zero, oh, sorry, one, 1.250. Oh. times the specific heat capacity of water, 4186, times the quantity, final temperature, minus 20. And that's all going to be equal to 0. <coughs> OK, some of these numbers I already know from the previous problem. For example, I know this one is 2640. I know that this one is 40,080. Um, and so now I still have a few to, to calculate. So if I multiply 0 0.12 times 4186 times the final temperature, I end up with 502 TF. This is a nice little um, bonus in that the, we're going to multiply by a temperature of 0 degrees. So that's, of course, not going to produce anything. This times this times 0 will be nothing. So we can move on to the next one, which will be 1.25 um, kilograms times 4186 times TF which will give me 5,233 TF. And then uh, 1.25 times 4186 times negative 20 gives me minus 104,650. <coughs> so pulling the common terms together, I would have 5,735 TF. That brings these two together. And then 2640 plus 40,080 minus 104,640 is minus 61,930. And again, that's all going to be equal to 0. So now just moving all that over to the other side, the final temperature will be 61,930 divided by 5,735. And that will give us a final temperature of 10.79 degrees. So we will call that 11 degrees Celsius. So these problems in which you have phase changes, they can be a little bit tricky because of the fact it's not always guaranteed. You know, if you just have two substances at different temperatures, and let's say they're both liquids, then they're just going to meet somewhere in the middle. And, and it's very simple. You're going to use this technique, and it's going to work for sure. But this technique would not have worked if it would have turned out that there was not enough energy to melt all of this ice. There would have never been this term. <clears throat> and therefore, when we went to try to calculate the temperature, it would have given us a faulty answer. So when you have a solid being mixed with a liquid, or say a gas being mixed with a liquid, or might even maybe even all three, you have ice being mixed with water, being mixed with steam, you really have to kind of put it together piece by piece in the way we did the previous problem and really figure out like where is the energy what do i have exactly what can i what can i pull off before you try to go on to go and just simply use the um, the exchange of energy must add up to zero if you feel very confident that they that they will that it, they, there will be complete melting the ice or the steam will condense back to water or whatever the situation is then this this technique should work um, perfectly fine